Welcome to the Carecast. Well, Simon, it's great to uh, be with you. I wonder if you could start just by telling us a little bit about yourself, what you currently do, um, and then just a little bit about your personal history as well. What have you done before your, your current role, as it were? Yeah, well, James, great to be with you on the podcast today. And um, I founded Forge Leadership about three years ago. Um, and that came out of really wrestling with questions that I found my peers were asking. So I'd spent 14 years in the telecoms industry um, as a senior exec uh, within that industry, um, and then 14 years as chief exec of Samaritan's Purse and the Billy Graham organization um, in the UK. And as I came to the end of that time and was wrestling and thinking about, well, what have I learned? What questions are my peers asking? And the five questions they were asking were, how do I keep a vibrant, lively, growing relationship with Jesus Christ on a daily basis? How do I know intimacy with Jesus? Um, Who am I? Who is the authentic Simon Barrington? Who's the real leader within me? Um, How do I lead with integrity? How do my words meet my actions? How do I keep going? How do I have an inner strength to keep going in the midst of what is a more volatile, uncertain, chaotic, ambiguous environment? And then how do I have the influence that God is calling me to have? So so I spend my time... um, training leaders, coaching leaders, working with them one-on-one, facilitating organizations um, into growth. And with a particular focus on the next generation of leaders, so millennial leaders. So we talk about raising up leaders of of influence and character. Um, So it's very much a character-based piece for us. So we don't do lots of webinars and series on time management or how to develop a strategy but much more about um, the inner life and how that impacts the way that you you lead i just i'm curious about um as you say you've been working with sort of younger leaders and as you look back on your time working with them working with other leaders from many different sectors how do you think uh, an understanding of leadership has changed over the last decade or longer has it changed or are there kind of new ways of doing it it's changed dramatically. So we did a research project a, a year and a half ago with the Bible Society where we interviewed 500 millennial Christian leaders. These are leaders in churches, um, in parliament, um, in charities, in business, um, and in the public sector. And we asked them things like, what's the best thing about leading? And they would say, the best thing about leading is raising up the next generation. Well, I wasn't saying that when I was 26, 27. I was saying the best thing about leading is the ability to create new ideas, change the world. But actually, they're saying, no, the the best thing about leading is people and raising up the next generation. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, The second thing, when they said, we asked them, you know, what, what were the key characteristics of a leader? They would say integrity, humility, and passion. Mm-hmm. So actually the character of a leader uh, has, has become more significant and the requirement for leaders to be more real, actually, um, and to be authentic and to bring the whole of themselves um, to their leadership and the way they lead um, has increased over the last um, couple of decades. So, so millennials, when they join an organization, will come from a position of not trusting the leadership. So their default position is we don't trust you. Um, and so how do you build trust? Well, only by being real, only be by being people bringing people into close proximity with you only by really working with them. And in an environment like coronavirus, where there's more uncertainty, it's more volatile, um, it's more chaotic, it's more ambiguous, then actually the requirement for leaders to be more vulnerable and to have more courage, because we don't have all the answers right now, do we? You know, anyone who says that they know all the answers to coronavirus and how we're going to respond to it is lying. Yeah, we, we, do, we don't have those answers. So how do you model a leadership that is both vulnerable, courageous, um, creates the riverbanks of direction and purpose whilst actually being agile and responding to the environment? So the next generation get that, actually. So I think we're going to see through coronavirus and as we come out, a real opportunity for the millennial generation to shape the future that they want to see in the midst of huge uncertainty. You mentioned there the the coronavirus, which obviously is dominating 
all of our thoughts, our minds, our hearts, and and is changed life quite dramatically just in the past eight weeks since this lockdown was was first introduced. And I just wondered, as you reflect personally on um, the experience that you have had, and as you look around you as well, um, you talk there about the importance of leadership. And I suppose it's a very basic question, but you could just elaborate on why authentic leadership is needed now more than ever, and then your own personal COVID experience. Yeah. So we like to think we're in control, don't we? Uh, as, as leaders, you know, leaders can be the biggest control freaks out there, actually. And, and often our, our, our control and, and our, our myth of control comes out of our own fears. Um, and so, you know, I spent, I would say I spent... Ooh, about 20 years of those 28 years um, in leadership, um, trying to expose the myth that I was in control, that I knew what was happening, and that I could set a direction um, that other people could follow. And it was the kind of superhero picture of leadership, which is, you know, I walk out the, the door in the morning, I put on my cape, you know, and everybody's going to follow me because I'm charismatic and I know where we're going. Um, and, and actually that myth of control is just a myth. And as Christians, actually, we should get that more than anybody else yeah. does. You know, we have a sovereign God who is absolutely in control. And when we get into crisis situations and disaster situations, then we realize again, we're not in control. Mm. Uh, we don't have all the answers. Here's a, a, a vicious um, virus, which... Um, we can't see and has just changed the course of all of our lives over the period of the last eight to 12 weeks. So, so we're not in control. So how do we respond when we're not in control and how do we live with uncertainty? And what I've learned in helping uh, leaders lead through uncertainty is that actually you need to lead by holding things in tension. Okay, so um, baby boomers, I'm a baby boomer. I'm actually on the baby boomer Gen X kind of boundary, and I kind of straddle that. Um, but actually, we were brought up to solve problems. You know, leaders solve problems. That's what we do. We get people out of the maze. Millennials will tell you, actually, um, we want to live well within the maze. We want to hold those things in tension. We're not about solving problems because actually a lot of the problems that we're faced with are just far too complex and we recognize that. And so we want to uh, be involved in actually helping people find their way out of the maze. And so um, millennials, we talk about with them about the polarities and holding things in tension. If you think about polarities, um, your breathing is a good example of a polarity. If I breathe in, and I only breathe in, I'm not going to last very, very long. I have to breathe out as well. And holding those two things in tension so I get enough aerobic exercise that my lungs fill and, and I'm breathing and I have aerobic efficiency and then I breathe out and the oxygen goes and they're taking enough oxygen that's a polarity so so leaders have these polarities that they have to hold in attention and in coronavirus that the polarities are you know the health our health and the economy a massive polarity you know this week we've had the government announcing uh, new steps to get us back out of lockdown uh, and they were openly saying we're holding in tension mm. our health and the economy and leaders have to hold intention health and the economy they have to hold intention challenge and safety in this moment progress and well-being online and offline forward focus and backward focus hierarchies and networks planning and just creativity and also excellence and grace yeah we want to be the best that we can possibly be in the midst of this coronavirus but actually, we're all struggling. So how do we find grace in the middle of that? So the biggest thing that a leader can do at the moment is help their teams to understand those tensions and to hold those tensions them, themselves well and to hold the uncertainty that is there and not be afraid to do that and not, be, not force themselves and then teams to make false choices within, oh, we're only going to do online. Oh, we're only going to look after people's health. We're, we're only going to do excellence. No, 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 actually, it's far more complicated than that. 
and helping teams and leaders to do that is, is something that I think in the midst of increased volatility we need to be able to do. Obviously, one leadership role that is very close to all of our hearts because uh, we're all um, benefit from it in so many ways is, is that of a church leader and called, those called to be sort of under shepherds of people yeah. must be so much more difficult when they're having to do it at a distance. I yeah. wonder if you could just elaborate a bit on some of those unique challenges that church leaders are facing, but also then how can they uh, really offer that that spiritual leadership at a time at a time like this so <clears throat> basically the, the bandwidth of our communication has been reduced and i think we need need to understand that so so as leaders when we lead we're leading with a breadth of communication and a multiplexity if you like of communications people see us in different contexts and 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 they understand how we're leading because we've had a coffee with them or we've walked down the path with them or um they've heard a sermon that we've preached but now it's just zoom isn't it i mean <laughs> or skype or webex or whatever but you know it, it's a, a single focus and, and, uh, and actually that's given us a narrow bandwidth. If you, if you like to think of it, or someone explained to me, uh, my colleague Matthew Frost explained to me the other day, is, you know, it's a bit like going through the Panama Canal or a canal in the Greek islands at Corinth where, where the canal just narrows and narrows and narrows and all you can see is it narrowing. And actually the, the, the amount of communication coming through that is, is limited. So what happens is people won't reach out with pastoral problems because they don't know how to do it in this context. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to ring, pick up the phone and talk to your pastor when you're stuck at home and you you have no frame of reference around you um, and all you're hearing is the news and how bad things are in hospitals and so actually the problem you're facing seems so small in response um, to that so we have to try and create a multiplexity of uh, communication channels and I think the churches and leaders that have done that well have not only done online services but they have zoom coffee sessions as well and they're ringing or have a pastoral system where people are ringing people or they have existing communities that they're encouraging to flourish so you're getting this multiplexity of views and I think trying to create that but it it's never going to be quite as good as being there in the flesh I think and seeing people from different angles and different um, perspectives so my my big advice would be recognize that communication is narrowed um, and broaden it as much as you can through a multiplexity of views it's interesting right now the things that have really impacted me have been someone sent me a hamper very nice which is very nice yeah. um, for a, 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 a webinar that I've done for them. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. But actually the impact that it had was disproportional to how it normally <laughs> would impact. Yeah? yeah. And that's because, you know, it was just out of the blue or different, you know, someone sent me a postcard, yeah, not from going away anywhere, just from their, <laughs> their home. And that had a disproportional impact as well. So, so find unusual ways of engaging and just saying, you know, uh, so my church this last Sunday did uh, Faces of Burlington. So we all had to send in a selfie. And as part of the service, we went, we're all missing one another, but here's pictures of everybody. From now and I thought, that's fantastic that's just given me another window yeah and, and another yeah. angle which is great i remember something uh, done recently in my own church was um quite often the children would do a kind of memory verse song with lots of actions and we'd all join in and they did videos of the children doing uh the latest the latest verse so it just kind of broke up the rhythm of how a normal kind of online service would go and as you say it meant yeah. you could see yeah. people and yeah. it's something really, and you, yeah, you're right. It was a disproportionate amount of joy that I was feeling because on a normal yeah. Sunday when I'm in the building, I don't feel that much joy. I mean, I love it, <laughs> but you know, but there's something that may meant much yeah. more. Um, yeah. Yeah. I want to, I want to um, just uh, arrow in on um, three R words that you've yeah. identified that you've kind of spoken about. Um, yeah. And this is 
based on um, a lot of it based on your experience with Samaritan's Purse previously. Yeah. Is that is that right? No, absolutely. So so I led Samaritan's Purse during the time when we responded to the Haiti earthquake. We were responding to the war in northern Iraq, um, Ebola in Liberia, uh, tsunami in uh, Boxing Day 2004. Um, and, and interestingly, I, I found myself feeling in the middle of March, just before lockdown, oh, this all feels really familiar. What, what, why does this feel familiar? Why, why, am I, why am I seeing and observing things that, that I've seen elsewhere and what is it? And as I kind of examined that, I went, oh, we're in the midst of a crisis. We're in the midst of a disaster response. It feels like the early days after a Haiti earthquake or the early days after an Ebola outbreak in, in Liberia. So what can we learn from the way that we respond to those disasters around the world? What models do we have? So, so the three words of response, recovery, and reconstruction are, are, are not new words. They're words that every disaster relief professional has kind of imprinted on them. And we know that when we go into Ebola in Liberia, there's going to be a response phase. And during the response phase, Everybody's running hard. It's all about delivery. It's all about saving lives. It's all about safety and stability. It's right back to the lowest level of Maslow hierarchy. It's all about, you know, toilet rolls, food. <laughs> yeah. And how we get our basics and our essentials. Yeah. And we were yeah. seeing that. It's all about people running hard to pivot everything because everything's different. Leaders were saying to me they've burnt out after a couple of weeks. Well, you see that in an emergency response. That, that is absolutely normal. Um, but then what I was finding was that people were saying, oh, well, how do we bounce back from response and start rebuilding? And I said, well, hang on a minute. Actually, there's, there's a middle phase. There's a phase of recovery. So after a Haiti earthquake, yes, there's that time period where it's the essentials and saving lives. But then you get into a period called recovery that is characterized by trauma, by grief, by the emotions of um, the people's emotions coming out, and so their mental well-being uh, being fragile, and a lack of confidence at getting back to normal. I remember when I was 23, it was my first experience of being in an earthquake, and I got thrown out of my bed in the middle of the night in Taiwan, onto the floor, I had to run out and sit outside the building, um, and uh, the feelings that you have at that moment, of when is it going to be safe to go back in? And what if there's an aftershock? Yeah, it actually teaches you something. And, and we're all in that space now. We're recognizing it. We're in that recovery phase where, you know, how long will it take us to get back to mm. normal? And how do we deal with our mental health and our mental well-being the things that have been pushed down in the response phase because at that point we were just we were just about our safety and but but in this phase you know those emotions start to come out so what we're saying to church leaders is you need to allow plenty of space for people to process that actually the demands on you as a leader during this phase are going to be even greater emotionally um, the pastors will need to come to the fore. So train your people in mental health and in trauma and in responding to grief. Um, have the support mechanisms in place because not everybody will run back into, what's the future of life look like? Let's reconstruct. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, a lot of people are going to go through, oh, I'm not sure about this. What should I be going back to? What do I want to keep from the past? What do I want to recreate but also i'm feeling uncertain and i'm feeling anxious so we're saying to church leaders be ready for that start well-being groups for people use that as an outreach from your church uh, mm. as well people in your community are going to want places to talk that's going to be their time when they're going to want to do that um, they're going to want to process and also finances are going to be really stretched for people yeah. there is no doubt about that over the next three years or so, unemployment's going to go up, um, the amount of disposable income is going to go down, and people are going to be really stretched. Um, so there's this metaphor of, uh, you know, um, which has been very popular about same storm, different boats. And I think that's very true as leaders as well, that actually not everybody has been in the same boat 
during this storm. And so some people are going to recover more quickly, some are going to recover more slowly. So don't go at the speed of the fastest. <laughs> um, just be aware that people will be processing, they will be struggling. And then you get to reconstruction. And as you come out of recovery, people go from the backward looking of memorial services and grief and the shock and trauma of what happened to forward looking into what kind of society do we want to create? What values are going to shape that? And, and we're already seeing some things, aren't we? Our health is going to be more important to us. Our relationships and our close relationships are going to be more important to us than ever. The slowness of life and the ability to walk through the park and breathe the fresh air and hear the birds singing is going to be more important to us than ever. Holidays in the UK are probably going to be more important to us than ever. Um, uh, our financial Financial health is going to be more important to us and we're also saying that um, trust is going to be a scarcity as well and that might be a more difficult one to get your head around but um, businesses are going to fail people are going to lose their jobs how we've been treated during this phase um, trust is reliability credibility but also empathy how we've been treated during this phase um, will um, determine how we're going to trust organisations going forward and a lot of trust needing to be rebuilt in society as we rebuild. And then finally, two other things. One is all the angst about the injustice is going to come out. Okay, So the injustice of why aren't key workers paid a living wage? Um, they put their necks on the line for us in this moment. They've saved lives. Why are we treating them? The way that we're treating that there's gonna be a massive issue so that it's inequality and injustice is going to have to find the focus um and, and be allowed to come out and people are going to become more passionate about that um within this next um phase as well in the church a massive opportunity to respond to the financial crisis the mental health um crisis but also to stand up on behalf of those who have no voice and speak out on behalf of them as well as you as you look ahead uh, now, as you think about uh, moving through these different phases, a as a nation, where do you think generally we are? Are we are we in the um, uh, the recovery phase at the moment, or are we are we are we in the beginning of the reconstruction phase? And and again, just maybe elaborating a little bit more on the role that the church can have. Uh, in shaping, because I think it's that whole question of the new normal, isn't it? What will the new yeah. normal look like? Yeah. What yeah. must do you think? What, what do you think the church should and, and can be doing to, to play a part in shaping yeah. that? Well, firstly, those phases overlap. So, and people trans, transition from one to the other at different speeds. So, we're recording this in the middle of May. Um, the tubes have just started running again today with people going back to work and other. The percentage is up 10 percent this morning something like that so it's first day back to work for a lot of people um so some people are starting to get into the recovery phase other people will still be on furlough until october yeah so yeah. those phases are going to overlap so that's firstly important and actually you can go back into the response phase so this is important for church leaders to understand is if someone in your congregation um, gets um, coronavirus or someone in their family gets it and they're in hospital in the middle of august or, Jul or september or october they're back in response phase mm. yeah so just understand that yeah? yeah so they overlap um in terms of how churches can shape i think we can shape by not rushing ahead to reconstruction by just slowing down and recognizing that the empathy with what people have gone through is a significant role for the church to play in helping the recovery process so i think we have a role before reconstruction and that's to come alongside people in their pain as that pain is released to be a place where people can feel safe and supported to process what they've been through and start the process of rebuilding so the, the process of rebuilding doesn't start with doing new things it starts with reflecting on where we've been and in building health and, and 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 my key message to leaders within that is actually that's going to take more empathy from you it's going to take more energy and your ability to be present in the moment with people and not rushing on is going to be vitally important for you um, during that phase and being vulnerable um, with courage because vulnerability takes courage during that phase is going to be really important um, for people. But then as we get into reconstruction, 
um, you know, what are the values that we've seen highlighted that actually are part of a society that we would like to see in the future? You know, is the all in this together NHS clapping? Is that something we'd like to see? You know, not the clapping necessarily, but but, but the sense of all being in, in it together. Well, what does that mean in terms of how we treat our key workers? What does it mean in terms of the injustices that we've seen? How do we create that ongoing sense of community and, and togetherness? What about the environment and the climate? Um, you know, we've enjoyed breathing in the fresh air. Or what does that mean for us in accelerating our stewardship of creation um, in this next phase? And what about innovation? What have we seen? You know, most churches saw more change in seven days than they've seen in 70 years at the beginning of coronavirus. You know, imagine going to your PCC a week before lockdown and saying, we're going to shut all the buildings, we're taking our services online, and we're not going to meet for three weeks, three months. Yeah? Mm. Well, they would have said, thank you very much, Vicar. Let's start looking for a new incumbent. You know, uh, it's just... <laughs> and, and yet the change that the, the people who started using video technology and enjoying online services, so that is going to change us. So what have we seen that's been creative and innovative that actually can be part of our futures? And then also, what are the dark sides of our culture um, and our society that have been exposed? Mm in this moment that actually we say we can't allow that to continue we have to tackle that that has to go up our agenda um, uh, in terms of how we deal with it um, going forward as well mm. i wonder finally if i if i could just ask you as you as you look ahead and as you think about uh, everything that we have gone through everything we're experiencing and the lessons that are being learned and, and need to be learned are you are you hopeful are you optimistic uh, about the, the changes in society that will flow from what we've gone through? I, I think I'm, I'm cautious at the moment. I think that it all depends on how we handle this next recovery phase. Um, if we give people enough time to process and to process well and we don't rush headlong into getting back to normal, I think the temptation for leaders is to to rush back um, and to get things going again. We need to get things going again. Mm. Um, so if we can hold intention, the need to get things going again and the need to reflect, and we can give ourselves the space to really process as communities what we've been through. You know, we've, we've been through horrendous sets of circumstances globally we don't even have the language to talk about a global pandemic and the, the emotional impact uh, uh, you know we've come close to our mortality in a way that we've not seen in since, probably since the second world war um, maybe, maybe a little bit with you know the tube bombings and and, and 9 11 but but in, in a big scale way since the second world war we need time to process that Mm. as people and that's going to be good for our mental health it's going to be good for our relationships it's going to be good for the long term of our society and then we can rebuild on mm. top of that so don't be too hasty um it is a process we need to walk through that process and and be kind to yourself as a leader actually you know the next 18 months are going to be really hard if we think the response phase has been hard the next 18 months are going to be really hard because they're going to be cycles of strategy and planning that are going to change mm -hmm. um, and, and and it's interesting i remember taking a group of business leaders to mozambique um, with some rounds person you take them out into the middle of um, a bush and you camp in the bush for seven nights and by day three they are totally reliant on you you know they're not asking for anything they just want to know they're going to survive and so they're compliant they obey instructions then the night before we fly back to the uk we take them to a holiday inn in maputo um which is like a three-star hotel one night there um and they come down for breakfast and they want to know why there's only orange juice and there is an apple juice and, you know, and all of a sudden they have choices. And yeah. because you have choices, then the 
anger comes out and the things that have been pushed down during that time just start to emerge and, and that's what we're going to see it's going to be more difficult because we now have choices you know lockdown wasn't a choice you just get on and do it now we have choices will you go back to work are we going to keep doing online services offline services small group and what are we going to do that is going to be demanding on leaders and it's going to need their all their emotional intelligence and um and presence and so be kind to yourself as a leader, um, dig into your emotional, physical, spiritual well-being at this moment, because actually you're going to need all the resources of heaven um, tapped into to help you lead well during this time. Simon, thank you so much for your, your time today. It's been incredibly helpful and we really, really appreciate it. Brilliant. Thank you, James. Remember to subscribe to get the latest episodes and find out more about the work of CARE on care.org.uk. CARE. For what you believe.